Hi, I'm Daniel Hartman. Welcome to Port and PA, a series sharing the stories of Pennsylvania's craft beer industry. We have a great lineup of stories for you in this episode. To kick things off, we visit with a brewing legend. Carol Stout blazed a trail for so many in the beer industry by becoming the nation's first female brewer and brewery owner when she opened Stout's Brewing Company in Adamstown. We sat down with Carol in February after she made the announcement that she was slowing down and scaling back Stout's brewing operations. Carol Stout, president and founder of the Stout Brewing Company in Adamstown, Pennsylvania. We had the restaurant, my husband's restaurant here, he's been here 58 years, and thought about starting a brewery, but in 1984, brew pubs were illegal, and I was staying home with my children, and when I thought about going back to school teaching, I thought, well, if he can't make beer, what about me? So I did the research and started my own company in May of 1987. The lagers grew very well for the first years, and then uh, we started brewing ales to please the uh, Philadelphia market and it's kind of, you know, grew organically because we didn't obviously have the money for billboards and, and advertising, it was mostly word of mouth. I did a lot of beer tastings, a lot of beer dinners and samplings, and of course that's the way I let people know about Stout. Well, in 1988, I did my first micro festival to educate people about craft beer and I invited the then existing breweries. So we had Goose Island from Chicago, we had Great Lakes from Ohio, Harpoon from Massachusetts, Dave Geary from Maine, Weeping Radish from North Carolina, uh, Sisson's Brew Pub from Maryland, and at that time the people who actually either owned the brewery or brewed the beer were actually there talking about the beer, which made it so special. So then we decided to do one three times a year. We did one in the spring for the local breweries as they were popping up, one in the summer for the southern breweries, and then one in the fall for the New England breweries. But it was tons and tons of fun. We lost a lot of breweries in the 90s because people with a lot of money getting into it very quickly and to having fancy packaging Unfortunately, they didn't do the research on the beer, and so it sat on the shelf and got old, and for a while, it gave uh, craft beer a wrap. Some people went back to their do domestic beers, some went back to their imports. So we lost a little traction for a while, but then the cream rises to the top, and so uh, it was actually better after that clean out for all of us. Historically, the styles of beer were made according to the water source, the ingredients that they could get, like the lagers, uh, the Helles beers of Munich, the uh, Nor Pilsners of Northern Germany, the Kolsches from Cologne, the Alt beers from Dusseldorf, uh, if you go to England, the ESBs and their pale ales interpretations. And then of course, you know, and those beers are still made today. And then in America, the, the early craft brewers, that's what they, you know, we started making beers, whether we were from Germany, make the German lagers or in English ales. And then obviously you can play with ingredients and to make special ones, but don't lose sight of the, the styles. I think that's very important. This is Stern, it's a German magazine. Oh, wow. What is troubling for me is a lot of breweries that are opening up are brewing these, I, I have to be careful. They're brewing beers 
in my opinion, that aren't stylistic. Uh, they're throwing glitter in beer. They're just kind of anything to make it gimmicky or thinking that wasn't done before. And some, they're making one-offs, meaning they make one beer, they sell it, then they make another beer, they sell it, they don't make the same beer ever again. Well, you know, I respect a beer who can make the same beer consistent, if it's of quality, and make it consistently and make it good. We educated people on styles. People didn't know what a lager was, a real Pilsner or a pale ale. ESB, and my generation educated people on those styles. The new drinker, they don't have a clue. And that, Bob, that is very troublesome for me. I would commend bars that would have a, a tap that was, you know, replica of the style. They'd have one Hellas, one Pale Ale, one IPA, one double IPA, one Porter, one Stout. Now you go in a lot of bars and they have 17 IPAs and probably most of them are hazy. That's not beer. It, they, it doesn't look like a beer. It doesn't taste like a beer. It's also very antiquated. We work for clarity in a beer. If I want my juice, I'll put it in my blender and make it and drink it. But when I want to drink a beer, I want it to look and taste like a beer. No offense to anyone that doesn't believe me. Well, I think the next several years are gonna be very tumultuous. Obviously, breweries are still opening up several a day. A lot of the older breweries my size are struggling. They're struggling for market share. Some of them are unfortunately making alternative things, like they're making canned cocktails, uh, they're making alcoholic seltzers, you know, just to keep the tent for the bottom line. I could have done that too, but I absolutely am a brewery and I am not going to ferment sugar. It's just not my thing at all. And I, I think some of those things are fads. I could be wrong. I think the real beer is here to stay, but I, it's definitely, uh, it's going to struggle for a while. But I think there are enough breweries out there making quality craft beers that uh, they aren't going to lose sight on that. This Christmas, everyone, first time in 20 years, came to Adamstown for Christmas. And they said, okay, Mom, for your 69th, you said you were going to slow down. Now you're 70. Showed me a calendar and said, pick a date. And so that's it. So I decided that I will stop the part that is the most stressful part right now, which is the production side, because there's so many breweries, the wholesalers have so many beers, the restaurants and the, the, the bar owners, they're constantly rotating in beers. It's not that they don't love any of my beers, they just wanna try everything new. And a lot of the, the young beer drinkers, they want the new beer. They don't want beers that are 20, 30, 40 years old. So, I Meaning not the beer, but the brewery itself. So it was very bittersweet, uh, obviously, uh, because I just love the people in the business and I love making beers. I just think the time right now is very volatile. And um, I think it's a good time to just kind of slow down. I started the Queen of Hops series two years ago. It was uh, 16 ounce cans, and we did three beers a year. My daughter Carrie, who does the artwork, she uh, had me count the number of beers that I brewed. And I obviously took, went through boxes and boxes of my brewing logs, and I would take a stack and do an educated guess. I couldn't have counted those, but came out to 1,784. How's that? <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun, yeah. That visit with Carol was recorded prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. We recently met up with her again after it was announced that Stouts would be selling off its brewing equipment. Well, before COVID, the idea was uh, to, I have a small pilot system and I was going to maybe get a seven barrel system 
and to brew beer for retail and for the restaurant and beer garden. But now COVID hit, so I don't know. But right now we do have beer to sell. We have, a, I purchased a crowler machine so we can have takeout because we sold uh, all of our equipment. We wish Carol and the entire Stouts team all the best. Next up, we travel to Western Pennsylvania to see how Burgers Brewing has made quality control a focus in their beer making. So Burgers itself got started by Fiori Mullets, my partner. We met at a crawfish boil at his restaurant, Della Terra. We became friends through the homebrew, moonshine, and uh, unwanted assistance in the crawfish boil that we uh, helped with. And, um, and so from there, we just kind of hit it off with the whole friendship, then beer thing. And he made a burger concept restaurant as a venture away from his fine Italian cuisine training. It became a hit for the next eight years. And when it became time to grow, um, Lawrenceville was the first expansion. And then came the brewery with the Lawrenceville expansion in 2017. And that's when I came along. Long story short, I ended up building the place, fitting the place out, and becoming the co-owner and brewmaster of Burgers Brewing and developing this space that we're in today. After Lawrenceville was open roughly two years, we expanded the Harmony location into now Zeely. So we now have a 130 seat restaurant in in Zelenopol, which is only about 400 feet down the street from the old restaurant, but it, it, it changed the uh, township. So we have a very large restaurant there where we have 12 beers on tap and a, a large outdoor seating gaming area and a much needed expansion for the, for the volume of business that was actually happening from the Harmony location. Since we're a restaurant as well, and we serve craft hamburgers with a lot of you know, varying taste and, and uh, components in them, I try to match the, the beer to the, the kind of food that we make. So that's everything from a light American lager and all the way into hazies and some seasonal stuff that will be a little bit more you know, spiced, creative, whatever. We do some kettle sours with fruit in them, but we pretty much range in the classic styles of beer that works well with our food menu and we, we keep 22 beers on tap between the two restaurants. That's a maximum of 12 different brands on tap at any given time, but uh, we're pretty diverse across the spectrum, light to dark, sour, hazy, all the good stuff as far as I'm concerned. So I come from a automation and controls engineering background, and I think data and analytics are super important to any product you make being able to track, being able to reproduce. And since we're more or less a flagship style brewery, all my beer needs to be very consistent and I want to track all the details. And so I just utilize the, the training that I have from those engineering background and turned it into a lab focus. My wife has been super helpful in helping me with the design of the lab and being able to interpret what is needed and the data, what it's saying. She's a neuroscientist at Pitt, researcher, and so her, her skill sets are super important with the way we are able to manage our lab and things here. I can, I can get some pretty friendly guidance from her when I'm on my best behavior. First was just getting a microscope and figuring out how to track our yeast to make sure we're getting proper pitches to um, ensure that the yeast we have is viable because putting, putting bad or beat up yeast into beer will, it will be the first sign of, of, of a bad product at the, at the end of the day. We started with yeast and now we're growing up from there to all sorts of microbiology detection. You know, it's simple, but it has to be done and it needs to be thorough. And as I adopt this can line into the process and potential distribution that I have no control over makes it more important for me to increase the amount of attention I'm putting on the microbiology and what I'm passing along down the line. For me, not being a, a, a super big guy in this business, um, that, could, that could really pose like some serious um, image issues if I put a few bad cans out there. That's, it's on worse beer blog the next day. This is a 
a, a first culture of a, a yeast, and it's a really dense swab, but um, I'm kind of looking for, in a, a fresh yeast propagation, looking for anything that would be an outlier. We do everything from wild yeast, enteric bacteria, gram staining, HLP media, very simple stuff. We're not a big brewery, we don't have tons of cash, but just like, I guess what would be the minimal for what I consider a, a comprehensive quality control lab, but you know, we, we, we do what we can to manage the beer that we have to ensure that we're not putting out any spoilers or any, any bad product that are you know, going to eventually reflect on our, our business and our, our image through putting out bad quality, bad product. We've been able to catch some very minor things through our cleaning process and actually rearrange the standard operating procedure to make things better, more comprehensive, and like have a better process through testing water, testing our chiller, testing even our keg washer, and having you know an idea of what's going through there, what lives there, and how it's passed or carried on through the beer, and then you know the final product is better because of that. So those are yeast cells, and they look really dark right here, but if you look at them in the scope, they're super As things super ramp super up, super as I get more comfortable in the lab, as like I really get more comfortable with what we're producing and the way we take data and what we want to collect and just the flow of information, the speed of information I'm learning every day and trying to build on that and as much as possible, try to increase the amount of attention to detail that we can put into the process is you know it's perpetual like we can't stop learning and we we can't rest when we think that we're good enough because the you know the next thing to come out will be you know a bad beer as, as soon as you quit paying attention so i'd hope to get an actually qualified lab tech in the expansion that uh fiori and i are right now trying to break ground on a 10,000 square foot brewery restaurant with a 15 barrel brew house and lots of cellar space, lots of lagering, lots of um, brewery centric um, seating area and really finally bring our, our brewery um, into the people. Right now we're hidden in this warehouse and people don't see the work that we do and associate it with the beer that they drink. The next step is to have a, a a, a monument to stainless steel in the background for people to, you know, drink and enjoy our product and really, you know, put it all together and, you know, finally take our concept into the reality of we, we brew a lot of beer, we brew good beer, and people want our beer. COVID-19 has made 2020 a challenging year for all of us, to say the least. The brewing industry is facing challenges like they've never seen. We talked with Adam Harris of the Brewers of Pennsylvania to see how we as consumers can help out. We're about eight months into this pandemic and we were able to kind of make it through the summertime. The Liquor Control Board gave us emergency powers where we could expand our premises so you could serve more people outside. But obviously as it gets colder, the amount of space you're gonna to have to serve people is gonna compress. And with the restrictions, it's gonna be extremely difficult for a lot of breweries to make it through this difficult winter time. So we're just asking everyone who's a craft beer enthusiast or just loves small businesses to just go out and do a little extra this winter. Six packs make a great gift to, to give for Christmas. I was talking to a friend of mine who owns a small business and he was, we were lamenting that Christmas music was on already. And he said, you know, I gotta start thinking about getting gifts for staff. And I said, what about a six pack for all your employees? He said, that's an amazing idea. So we linked him up with a small brewery. And you know, if everyone just did a little bit more this winter, I think we're gonna see everyone survive. With the explosion in breweries we've had, we went from about a couple dozen 10 years ago to about 350 in Pennsylvania. A lot of the newer breweries that popped up, they were strictly the tap room model. So they required people to, you know, basically come in, sit down and have a drink right there uh, on premise. Well, now that you're only allowed to have 50 or maybe 25% if, if anything gets rolled back, you're really cutting down any revenue that that tap room model is gonna be able to generate. So, you know, a lot of these breweries, they were able to pivot rather quickly and get to canning beers and using crowlers more than they ever thought that they would have. You know, the businesses that were able to pivot in a very fast fashion 
have done well. But for those that are still using, utilizing the tap room model, we want to ask everyone to, you know, if they can only have 50% capacity, let's make sure they always have 50% capacity. Go out and support them. They are going above and beyond to make sure the experience is safe. They are socially distancing. They were cleaning constantly. Um, every brewery that I've gone to, I felt was a very, very safe experience. And we recognize the opportunity to continue to get better in that space. And we introduce- We are the official statewide guild for breweries here in Pennsylvania. We have over 200 members. Um, from you know the very small to the very large. We have a board of 12 members that's very geographically spread out and it represents tap room breweries all the way up to production and large breweries. And you know we get together on a monthly basis and talk about what's going on in PA beer, what we can fight for legislatively to make Pennsylvania a better beer state, and just make sure that, that there's a future for breweries of all sizes here in Pennsylvania. All the brewers in Pennsylvania, we generally get together on a yearly basis for a symposium. We can't do that, so we are gonna go all virtual on our symposium, um, which you can find at our website. One interesting and I think really great thing that we did is generally it's restricted to Brewers of PA members. We're opening that to up to anyone, whether you're a BOP member or not. So you can come in, you can look at our content, you can kind of learn what we're about. And then hopefully, you know, as things pick up in 2021, we'll, those breweries that participated in the symposium will, will join the BOP and we'll continue to grow our organization and, and fight for Pennsylvania beer. We work in conjunction with the Brewers Association out of Colorado, and they have a great idea of Small Brewery Sunday is, it really just puts a highlight on all the breweries here in Pennsylvania and kind of plants that seed in people's mind that, hey, go visit them this Sunday, support them. But I think that also then continues through the holiday season of, you know, okay, look, I visited this brewery on, you know, Small Brewery Sunday. Let's pick this up for Christmas or let's pick this up for our holiday celebration. So we really appreciate, we get a lot of great support from the Brewers Association and uh, we appreciate them pushing this national agenda for Small Brewery Sunday. Obviously the big guys are still gonna be here in 2021 and 2025 and 2030. These are small businesses. A lot of them just have you know, credit card loans that they use to start up their business or a small bank loan. They don't have huge cash resources to make it through these critical times. So every purchase you can make, whether it's a crowler to go, a six pack for a friend or a relative, or grabbing a case to go to Thanksgiving or to your holiday celebrations, it really does help. And if everyone in Pennsylvania joins and does this, and we see that momentum throughout the state, I think we're gonna carry all of our brewers through uh, into 2021 when we hopefully defeat the virus. Thanks for joining us. If you haven't yet, make sure to click subscribe on our YouTube channel. We have lots more great stories in the works. We'll leave you with one more in our brewery spotlight. Check out the proper in Quaker Town. Until next time, cheers. I bought him a make your own beer kit for Father's Day and he loved it. And therefore one morning he woke up and his exact words are, let's open a brewery, it'll be fun. <laughs>I was an IT project manager for a big corporation. I was with them for 21 years, and one day I'm like, I'm done. And I think this is now the time to do it, and uh, somehow I convinced her, and here we are. And I worked in a dental office for 25 years. I loved my career. <laughs> I still don't know how I talked her into it, so. I really don't know how he talked me into it either. Never go back to what you were doing before? Never, ever. No. We were looking at a place on 309, yeah. and we knew the guy that owned this building, and Brian came to ask him a permit question. And he sold us on it. That was <laughs> And he said, nope, Chris will never go for this place, because it was big, it's big. And it was in bad shape, it was in really bad shape. But yeah, after we got created our business plan, we started looking, and then we fell into this, and right. it was a ton of work, but uh, you know, I would, don't worry It's a great anything. space. It's a really beautiful building. This is the Palace Theater. It was built in 1922. It was originally a vaudeville theater, and years later it turned into silent films and then a movie theater. There's a lot of history here. There's a lot of original work still in the building. 
The original stage from 1922 is still in the back, fully restored. Yeah. People remember coming here on dates. Yeah. From the, like, like when it was a movie theater, they remember coming on dates or they remember running from the police. We hear a lot of stories of... Like right now we're sitting in the back of the theater, so the projector room was right up there and it would project down to the stage and um there was a crying room and yeah. the guys would tell us like we used to sneak a drink in there and run away yeah. and yeah so i grew up in philadelphia and all my friends you know we used to hang out together of course but my one friend his brother built a, um, a bar in his basement and it was a really nice bar i mean nice and one time some girl came in and said wow that's a proper bar so that's how the name kind of got, you know, started. So uh, every Thursday we'd go down to the proper, no matter what. We'd, we'd, we'd be down there, just drink a couple beers. We'd have parties down there, and oh, it, was, it was a really nice, really nice setup. But then my best friend's brother, his name was Dave, um, he decided to get married and moved to New Jersey, and he closed the proper bar. So we're like, oh man, it's just, you know, proper's done, and you know, everybody's. So we're coming up with names, and I said, "What about the proper?" And, and he always like, wore his proper shirt. Yeah, we, proper yeah, they had, oh, yeah, we had shirts made up. I mean, it was you know a legit basement bar. bar. <laughs> so I just said, "Hey, what about the proper?" And she's like, "Yeah, let's do it." So. We're located in Quakertown, Pennsylvania. We're the downtown borough section of it. We're seeing a big upswing in businesses and just people coming out, and it's. It's a really great place to have a business and raise a family. We are a full restaurant and we do Pennsylvania spirits and Pennsylvania wine, but we also have a banquet facility. A lot of fun events happen in the back room and there's not many places around that are that large. We can have about 350 people at cocktail setting. So it's a really good room. It has its own bar back there. All of our food comes out of there too, so you don't have to bring anything in. We set it up, we clean it up for you, and it's, it's just a nice venue. We also do a lot of give back, a lot of uh, yes. community give back, um, and, and blood drives. I mean, the, the, yeah. the Red Cross told us that they've never had so many people at their blood drives, because we offer a free pint with a, for a pint, so. Um, and we're heavy in the community. We do a ton of fundraisers, whether it's you know for kids or dogs or. We just do a lot of give back. We we enjoy the community, so we want to help them because they've helped us with everything in building our business. 